Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you that have not uh, joined one of uh, one of our webinars before, I'm April Razo, uh, one of the registered dietitians with Florida Cancer Specialists. Today, we are going to talk about carbohydrates to eat or not to eat. There is all kinds of information about good carbs, bad carbs, um, high carb, low fat diets, uh, low carb, high protein or high fat diets. Um, and so we just want to delve into what are carbohydrates, what is their role in our diet, what nutrition do they offer, should they be in your diet. Um, so that being said, when you think of carbohydrates, when you hear carbohydrates, is it would help if my clicker worked. There we go. Is this what comes to mind with the word carbohydrates? Pasta, pizza, donuts, bagels, right? Breads, pastries. But when you hear the word carbohydrate, do you think about these foods also? Uh, beans, fruit, whole grains. There is a difference between those two types of carbohydrates that we're going to get into today. So what is a carbohydrate? I promise that I am not going to make this a chemistry class, but just as kind of a simplified overview, carbohydrates come from plants. There are natural sources of carbohydrates and there are manufactured refined sources of carbohydrates. Um, they are one type of three macronutrients. So your macronutrients are going to be protein, carbs, and fat. Uh, and I am going to take one moment to kind of pause our presentation because I forgot to mention some housekeeping at the very beginning. I'm so sorry. If you have questions, please click on the Q&A box. Um, you can type your questions in there and then we'll try to hit them at the end, okay? Sorry about that. Um, so back to carbohydrates, it's a macronutrient, one of three. We have carbs, protein, and fat, okay? It's important to say that most foods are not strictly one or the other as far as carbs, protein, and fat. Most foods are a combination of at least two, if not all three. Um, carbohydrates are the primary energy source for your body, for your cells. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then, again, this is a very simplified chemistry uh, lesson. But these are some of the common players without getting in, without getting super detailed about molecular structure. Glucose is the very basic form of sugar, of carbohydrates. It's brain fuel. That's what I like to call it. All of your cells use glucose for energy, but, the, but your brain really prefers glucose. Fructose, found most commonly in fruit and honey, and even in a very small percentage in vegetables. Um, lactose is your milk sugar. Uh, and then sucrose is table sugar, corn syrup, um, those refined sugars. There we go. Can I skip it? Okay. Um, so there are two different kinds of carbohydrates, and this is where we get into the thinking of good carbs versus bad carbs. Um, you have complex carbohydrates, and then you have simple carbs or refined carbs, okay? Um, so let's talk about the, the couple of kind of exceptions to the rule. Technically, when we're looking at molecular structure, fruits and milk are actually classified as simple carbohydrates uh, because of the number of, of sugar units in that structure. Um, fruit behaves as a complex carbohydrate, especially if you eat it whole, unprocessed, with the, the skin or the peel. Um, fruit provides a ton of vitamins, minerals, fiber, 
So even though it is technically classified a simple carbohydrate, it really does behave as a complex carbohydrate. Your other complex carbohydrates are vegetables, legumes, uh, so beans, peas, and lentils, and then whole grains. So when we say whole grains, it's not just whole wheat bread. We're talking about uh, brown rice we're ta or wild rice, um, barley, uh, farro, um, all of those grains that uh, when you walk down the rice aisle, all those other grains that are that are there are considered whole grains. Okay. When they're refined, so white rice, the instant, uh, instant oatmeal, the boil in a bag type stuff, the more refined it is, the more nutrients that you're losing in that process. So in the other category, we have simple carbohydrates, we have refined carbohydrates. Milk, we said, is classified as a simple carbohydrate because it doesn't have the complex molecular structure, but milk provides a lot of health, health benefits. It's a great source of calcium and vitamin D, and it's also a source of protein. Um, and and a, you know, a lot of people cannot do dairy for various reasons. There are milk substitutes that are fortified with that calcium, that vitamin D, so that you're getting the same benefit. Others, other refined carbohydrates, white bread, sugary beverages like soda, um, fruit juices. Now fruit juices are kind of an interesting case. They're lacking the fiber, all of that, the, the, the fiber benefit that you would get from eating a whole fruit, but they still contain uh, the vitamins that you would get from eating fruit. Um, so the fiber is the biggest loss. You also have to be really careful with fruit juices that you're getting no added sugar, that you're getting 100% fruit juice without all of that added sugar that we tend to find in fruit juices. Um, chips, cookies, crackers, pastries, candy, those are all refined carbohydrates. And those are the type of carbohydrates. We don't say you should never eat them. They're, they're in everyone's diet as a treat, as a snack, at a party. Um, but we do recommend that they are not a large part of your diet. We really should be limiting refined carbohydrates. They're not providing a real nutrition source in most cases. Um, you can think of them as empty calories for the most part. So let's break down carbohydrate nutrition. Um, carbohydrates have four calories per gram, same as protein. Protein also has four calories per gram. Fat weighs in at nine calories per gram. Um, so these are, this is kind of the breakdown of carbohydrates, your whole grains, fruits and vegetables, legumes. You're getting B vitamins like folate. You're getting vitamin E. We said you're getting fiber from those carbohydrates, um, zinc, magnesium, uh, particularly in legumes and the whole grains. Um, and in those two, the whole grains and legumes, you're getting fiber and you're also getting protein. Remember we said most foods contain more than one of those macronutrients. Um, and so both of those, the whole grains and the legumes, are an excellent source of fiber and at the same time from the carbohydrate and at the same time an excellent source of protein. Uh, fruits and vegetables, you're getting vitamins and minerals. You're also getting phytonutrients. The phytonutrients give them their color. And I should have said starchy and non-starchy vegetables because you're getting that in both. Uh, but the phytonutrients give them their bright, vibrant colors and have a lot of immune boosting properties and anti-inflammatory properties. So carbohydrates are composed of starch and dietary fiber. So the starch is what gives you energy. The starch breaks down to that glucose molecule that we talked about. Um, and as an aside, in commercial use, um, starch is used as a thickener uh, in the fruit pie fillings, the sauces, gravies, instant pudding mix, salad dressings. It makes a really good thickening agent. 
There are two types of dietary fiber. Um, so you have soluble fiber, which gets digested in the intestine and actually serves as a prebiotic to promote that healthy gut bacteria. Um, soluble fiber is in oats and apples, um, citrus fruits like oranges and beans, legumes. And then you have insoluble fiber. The insoluble fiber doesn't get digested, so it adds bulk and it promotes that healthy gut, okay? So that, we have, so that we're regular. Uh, the insoluble fiber is also found in beans. So those legumes are a great source of both types of fiber. Um, foods like cauliflower and broccoli are gonna have insoluble fiber. So ideally you want both in your diet. Um, soluble fiber also slows digestion. So it helps make you feel full for longer. And because it slows that digestion, it also slows the absorption of glucose, of the starch. Uh, so people with diabetes, um, that having that fiber, having that soluble fiber in your diet or at a meal can help lower the rate that that meal causes your blood sugar to rise. It can help reduce cholesterol because it has a binding effect in the gut. So it tends to bind those products and pull them out. Um, we said it acts as a prebiotic also. So overall, those whole grains, that dietary fiber promotes a lot of gut health and gut integrity. Stored glucose is uh, called glycogen, excess glucose. So we're going to say this more than once. If you eat too much of it, it can contribute to weight gain, just like any other food. So we're talking about all the benefits of carbohydrates, but if you eat it in excess more than your body needs, it is stored as glycogen for short-term energy. Well, it's stored as glycogen, but the excess is stored as fat. Okay, that was where I was trying to get to and I finally made it. So, so you have glucose being stored as glycogen. That's your short-term energy bank, okay, between meals when your body is, is needing fuel. And then that excess that you ate that you didn't need is stored as fat. And that's kind of your long-term energy bank, all right? Um, lots of people talk about the glycemic index of foods, of carbohydrates, and trying to focus on lower glycemic index foods. So the glycemic index is a ranking of carbohydrates, and it's based on how quickly the food raises your blood sugar, how quickly it gets absorbed and affects your blood sugar. Uh, so low glycemic index foods get absorbed slower and so they have less of an impact on your blood sugar. It doesn't spike it as much as high glycemic index foods. Um, the glycemic index can change or can be influenced by how the food is cooked and what foods you eat in combination, because most of the time we eat a meal with a, a variety of foods and not just one food at a time. Um, and also there is a little bit of discrepancy on what is considered low. I went to three different websites and I found three different ranges of what was considered low glycemic index, okay? But just to give you an idea, the glycemic index of glucose, which is pure sugar, uh, is 100, okay? So on a scale of one to 100, that's what we're looking at. Um, keep in mind, that not all low glycemic index foods are healthy foods. So we can't put all of our eggs in that one glycemic index basket, so to speak. Um, because, it, you know, look at this, apple juice, banana cake made with sugar, real sugar, pound cake, chocolate, they, all those foods have a glycemic index of less than 50. This is out of 100, okay? Um, now, again, I, I said I went to three different websites, so some just had low and high, so 50 or 55 was the cutoff. Some had low, moderate, and then high, 
And so those foods in the 50 to 60 range would have been in the moderate category. But all these foods were below 50. And it's not like I'm suggesting that you go eat a lot of chocolate and pound cake. Um, so glycemic index may play a role in choosing healthy foods, but it's not, and it's not the answer to all of our questions. What about low carb diets? Uh, so in a low carb situation, the body uses fat or possibly protein for energy. So the body can use those other macronutrients. It is less efficient. Those pathways are less efficient than using glucose for energy. Uh, when we use fat for energy, um, your body breaks down that fat and produces ketones uh, as one of the end results. Ketones are mildly acidic. Long-term use uh, of a diet high in fat and low in carbs could cause a buildup of those ketones in the blood, um, which our blood is slightly alkaline, it's slightly basic. So if those ketones build up over time, you're actually making the blood slightly acidic. Um, protein as energy, I usually see this more often in malnutrition situations where people are generally just not eating well. And so then the body starts to break down muscle to access that protein and convert it to energy. Uh, so in those situations, we're actually compromising muscle and cell growth, cell maintenance, because protein are the build. Protein is the building blocks for for those. Um, and so, fat we can use. Protein we really don't want to use carbohydrates are the preferred for energy. Um, but in those long-term, I mean, long-term, those low carb diets, they have been shown to, to possibly be effective for short-term weight loss, um, for diabetic control, okay? So when I say short-term, we're talking about three months to six months. Um, and so they could potentially be useful in a situation where we're trying to get control of those things quickly. Um, and then to consider reintroducing some healthy complex carbs to make the diet a little bit more balanced. A lot of studies that compare different types of diets, low carb, high carb, high protein, high fat, low fat, right? They're comparing those diets to assess weight loss success. Um, short term, three months, six months, those diets all have different degrees of weight loss. And at those three month and six month markers, the low carb diets definitely see a more drastic weight loss than say the more moderate Mediterranean balanced plate method. When we take those studies out farther, we look at 12 months or two years, the people on those more drastic weight loss diets have started gaining weight. And so at 12 months and 24 months, those end results look a little bit more similar among all of the diets, okay? Now that could be because the diets stop being effective. More likely, it's because a lot of those diets are a little too extreme and it's hard for people to maintain them for long periods of time. Uh, so short term can be effective depending on your goals. Uh, long term, you run the risk of some nutrient deficiencies with the low carb diets because remember we talked about all those potential health benefits uh, that are in the complex carbohydrates. Um, so there is a way to do low carb diets in a, health, a, a healthy way to do low carb diets, um, focusing on non starchy vegetables like broccoli and green beans uh, and asparagus and dark leafy greens, because they have such a small amount of carbohydrates. Um, but it takes a lot of planning, it takes a lot of effort to do those low carb diets in a healthy way. Uh, what about gluten? Is gluten-free healthier? Should we avoid gluten? Um, so gluten is a, a protein found in wheat. 
And it, so most of your baked goods, your breads, pastas, cereals, crackers are going to contain gluten. Gluten is not going to be found in fruits or vegetables. It's because there's no wheat. Uh, so at this point in time, we don't have any evidence that wheat or the gluten protein causes weight gain any more than any other food. Um, we know, we talked about this a little bit earlier, that whole grains promote gut health. They, I don't think I mentioned this before, but they have been shown to reduce the risk of GI cancers because they're promoting that gut integrity. Um, and we said they provide energy and vitamins and minerals. Um, so at this point in time, we, we're lacking any kind of real evidence that says we should be avoiding wheat or gluten unless you have a wheat allergy like celiac disease or a gluten intolerance or sensitivity. Um, so gluten, it, gluten isn't bad for our gut unless you have an allergy or an intolerance to it. And I've got another question. Um, if the body needs to break down either muscle or fat to generate energy, which one does it start with? I, it, typically, from what I have seen, it goes for fat first before protein. Uh, the, the biggest areas where we see protein breakdown, muscle breakdown, is like I said, in a malnutrition situation where people are just generally not getting enough nutrients and then the body starts breaking down protein. Uh, but in the absence of glucose, typically the body is going to start breaking down fat, which is, we said earlier, that long-term storage, uh, storage bank for energy. And I said this before, I will say it again, any food in excess can cause weight gain, okay? This I, calories in versus calories out has been long debated. It is not that simple. I recognize that this is a very simple description of a very complicated process. But at the end of the day, whether you're looking at carbs, protein, or fat, if you eat more than your body needs, you are going to store it and gain weight, okay? Uh, that's kind of just how it works. Um, now, quantity and quality matter. Potatoes get a bad rap, right? Do we eat a half cup of roasted potatoes that we used olive oil for in addition to our three ounces of chicken and our salad? Or do you eat a loaded baked potato stuffed with butter and sour cream and cheese and bacon with your 32 ounce steak? Or the big basket of fries with your equally large basket of fried shrimp or fried chicken. It matters, okay? So my plate, I, if any of you have seen this graphic before, I've used it in some of my webinars before. Um, we replaced the food guide pyramid with my plate. And so what it is showing is ideally what a balanced meal would look like, what your plate should look like. Um, so you can see a quarter of the plate is protein, a quarter of the plate is grains, starchy vegetables, right? Those carbohydrates, some of those carbohydrates. And then the other half of your plate should be largely vegetables, maybe some fruit, okay? And then if you drink dairy, hopefully some low fat milk on the side, okay, that's optional. Um, three quarters of the plate is plant-based, fruits, vegetables, whole grains. But the starchy, the grains, the starchy vegetables that have a lot of the calories, a lot of the energy is a much smaller portion. It's only a quarter of the plate, okay? So it's not a basket of fries and some chicken with no green vegetables. That's not a balanced meal. Uh, potatoes we, uh, are a great fiber source, are a great potassium source. We eat too much and we eat poor quality. 
right? Because of the deep fried or everything that we add on to it. So let's talk about what this means in real life. And I, at the bottom, I've got a couple of links for you. I'm leaving them up in case you are trying to copy them down. Um, Choosemyplate.gov, that's the website for Choose My Plate. There are a lot of really great mess, uh, recipes and meal ideas on there. And then also American Institute for Cancer Research has a great section with recipes uh, that I would highly recommend. That picture um, is from one of their recipes. It's a Southwestern salad, bean salad. So it's got black beans, corn, bell peppers, salsa. Um, so it would make a great side. There's a little bit of protein. Uh, if I remember correctly, the nutrition breakdown per serving, it was only five grams of protein. That's not really enough to constitute a meal, but that would make a beautiful side dish, you know, for your chicken or your fish or whatever else you were having for that meal. Um, so let's break this down into real life, a serving of carbohydrate, right? You all want to know how much you should have because that's what we're talking about. So a serving is considered half of a bagel, a slice of bread, a half cup of dry cereal, rice, or pasta. That doesn't mean you can only have that one serving at each meal. Typically, the American diet has somewhere between four to six servings of carbohydrate per day. Excuse me. Usually, it's closer to six servings per day. Uh, it's important to note, remember that very first picture that we showed with that mountain of pasta? Half a cup of dry pasta comes out to at least a cup cooked, okay? So we're not talking about giant plates of pasta. We're talking about a side of pasta with some chicken or some fish and a green vegetable, hopefully, okay, to make that balanced meal. Uh, a serving of vegetables, one cup raw, a half cup cooked, because when you cook the vegetables, they tend to shrink down. Uh, with fruit, same thing, uh, about a half of a cup cut or cooked, a medium piece of fruit like a plum or a gala apple. A banana, usually bananas are pretty big, they tend to be two servings. Uh, dried fruit, because it is dried and, and that sugar is concentrated, a quarter of a cup is a serving of dried fruit. For milk, one cup of milk or one cup of yogurt would be considered a serving. Uh, generally speaking, carbohydrates make up about half of your diet, of your total daily calories. Um, protein and fat make up the rest. We recommend that you make half of your grains, at least half of your grains, whole wheat or whole grain, okay? Um, and for fruits and vegetables, start with at least five a day between the two. We want more than that if we can get it, but start with five a day. If you're a milk drinker, two to three servings of dairy per day generally uh, meets your calcium needs. Okay, so something to think about there. And to wrap up, if you're still with me, I appreciate that. Um, Starting next month, we haven't done this before, starting next month, we are going to start doing virtual teaching kitchens. So we're going to alternate. Uh, so one month, it'll be this, this kind of webinar. The next month, it'll be the virtual teaching kitchen, then the webinar, then the teaching kitchen, and so on. Um, so every other month, we're going to cook together. Okay, so you'll, we haven't done the flyers, stay tuned, we're still ironing out those details, but that's what we're cooking. That picture that you see is what we're making, okay? So there will be a way for you to register so that I can send you the ingredient list ahead of time so you can do some shopping, uh, and then we get to cook together virtually. Um, any other questions? I've been keeping my eye on the Q&A, I know Dana has also, um, but if there are any other questions I can answer at this point. Let me see, oh, we've got the chat box too. Okay, no questions there. 
All right, guys. Well, I think I have used up my time for today. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, and hopefully I will see you all for the Teaching Kitchen in February.